We look at hymns and godly patience today. Welcome, it's another look into the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot. She was one of those calling us to live to a higher standard each day. As our series continues in the coming weeks, we'll hear from family, friends, and others who were influenced by Elizabeth's life and her message. A welcome. Well, today we wrap up our 11-part series called His Eye is on the Sparrow with a word about hymns. Also, a look at All in Good Time. Joining us today, Ed McCauley and Jim Elliott. It's a question and answer session. Have you ever wondered what to pray for when it came to missionary friends? Maybe somebody your, your church supports? Well, here are some ideas from Jim Elliott coming up later as he and Ed talk about prayer requests many years ago. Do you love the great old hymns of the faith? Or maybe you don't know of the richness of that musical heritage. I want to put in a plug for hymns. I talk about this often, and my husband and I, of course, travel around and are in very many churches, few of which really know any of the old hymns. We get invited to many churches where they don't even have hymn books. All they have is the overhead. And even when it is a church where a few hymns get sung, uh, it doesn't seem as though very many people know them anymore. That was one of the great blessings and privileges of, of growing up in the home in which I did because my father herded us all into the living room every morning after breakfast. And we always sang a hymn. Both my parents played the piano, so one or the other would sit down at the piano, and we would go straight through a hymn book, and we sang every stanza, one hymn per day, all the stanzas. And that's, that's been priceless heritage, because all six of us know probably hundreds of hymns by heart. And we just consider that a very great gift that our parents gave us. Now, you can do that in your home, even if you don't have a piano. You can teach your children to sing, and, and children, again, I emphasize how miraculously children can memorize. They can not only learn a language very quickly, but they can memorize very, very easily. As you know, if you have a television, they can pick up the commercials without any problem at all. So if they're going to stuff their heads with a lot of junk, you might as, stuff them, might as well stuff them with something highly worthwhile, including, of course, the memorization of scripture. But one of the hymns that is so much more meaty theologically than so many of the, well, many of, of what are called praise songs, I have nothing against them, please don't misunderstand me, but many of them are very, very thin theologically. And the really meaty one, the old hymns of the church are the ones that mean the most to us in the deepest waters and the hottest fires. One of our favorite hymns as a family was How Firm a Foundation, Ye Saints of the Lord, is laid, a, laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said, to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled? And the next two verses are taken directly from Isaiah 43. When through the deep waters I call thee to go, the rivers of sorrow shall not overflow, for I will be with thee thy trials to bless, and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all-sufficient shall be thy supply, etc. But one of the great hymns that I wanted to mention is that great hymn by William Cooper, God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps, where? In the sea and rides upon the storm. Have you ever seen any footsteps in the sea? He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. And then there's a stanza that says, Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and will break in blessing on your head. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. 
The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. And the older we get, the more we realize the truth of that, because the more experiences we, we have to look back on, experiences which we just dreaded and hated when they happened and just couldn't imagine what God was doing and how this could ever do us any good spiritually, um, we look back and realize that the bud did have indeed a bitter taste, but sweet has been the flower. And I think of all the ways of God in my own life, uh, one of the blessings of keeping a journal is that you can go back and read things that you have completely forgotten. I've been keeping journals just about 60 years. So I can go back and look in those journals and realize that if somebody asked me if this thing or that thing ever happened, I would say no and I wouldn't be lying because I had completely forgotten it. It's a, it's a chronicle of the faithfulness of God. And I love going back to a simple little hymn like his eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches me. We need the very simplest reminders at times, don't we? We don't just need profound theological truths, but we need very, very simple little things that God in his mercy reminds us of. I remind you again of his word, are not many sparrows sold for a farthing? Now when the sparrow gets sold, of course the, the sparrow has been caught, which has been painful for the sparrow. The sparrow is probably jammed into a cage full of other sparrows. I've been in an Arab market where they were still being sold and they're treated very cruelly and of course when they are bought, then of course either they're kept in another cage or they're eaten. Very often they're just eaten and we wonder what in the world kind of meat you could get off of a sparrow and I think back to my days in the jungle when my daughter had a little friend who was very good with a blowgun. He was only 10 years old, but he was a crack shot with that blowgun and he would come back with the tiniest birds, as small as hummingbirds sometimes, beautiful iridescent colors, just lovely little creatures. Of course, they were all dead by the time he brought them back and he would string them on the string around his waist. This was a little Alka boy and the only piece of clothing that they wore was a piece of string so they had no pockets but he would hang them by their necks inside this little string around his hips and of course when I got to the point where I could ask questions as foreigners do I wanted to know why the Indians wore that string. It was the standard regulation costume of everybody, men and women and children and of course they looked at me with utter shock and they said, well you wouldn't expect us to go around naked, would you? <laughs> but the sparrows fall and the sparrows get sold and the sparrows get eaten and the sparrows have lice. So there's all sides to this life, aren't there? There are wonderful things, thrilling things, unexpected things, hoped for things, and there are very unexpected things and things which we never in the world would have chosen and all of them, all of them are a part of God's sovereign sanctifying work in us. And I want to give you for your memorization a commitment. I don't know the author of this and maybe someone does. If you do, I'd be glad to hear who it is. But this is a very sobering kind of commitment to make to God and it's one that helps me again and again. I'm willing to receive what you send to do without what you withhold, to relinquish what you take, to suffer anything you inflict, to do what you command, to be what you ask me to be at any cost, now and forever. We have a loving Heavenly Father who loves us with an everlasting love. And we know that there's never a time when those arms are not underneath us, whether we feel them, whether we sense his presence or not. 
And there may be someone here who lost something this week, or someone. Why does God allow us to lose things? I don't know anything more irritating to my very organized soul than losing something, because I am so proud, I guess I have to admit, of being organized. I know where things are. In our house, we have a place for everything. But then every once in a while, my pen, for example, is not in its place. And it has, I have a pen holder right on my desk, so of course that's where the pen belongs, and it's not always there. And I can just get frantic turning everything upside down and emptying all the waste baskets and doing everything possible to try to find that thing. And the Lord very often has to remind me, I'm not perfect. I do make mistakes. I do lose things. And sometimes he disciplines me about my attitude in losing something by saying to me, you don't need that pen right now. You had already turned on your computer. Now you sit yourself down to that computer and you do what you were going to do this morning and forget about the pen. And you know what happens? It's amazing, but this has happened again and again. When I get all upset about something that I think must be done right now, the Lord says, no, that is not the thing that must be done right now. The next thing is what you had already determined to do when you noticed that the pen was gone. Do the next thing and then Maybe I'll show you where the pen is. And you know he's done that. <laughs> that has happened. I'm telling you the truth. I spend two hours on the computer, and when I stop, suddenly the one place I haven't looked comes into my mind. And God gives it to me back. Now maybe someone here has lost something much more precious and irreplaceable than a pen. Can you receive that? as from the Lord. Can you pray that prayer that I just dictated to you? I am willing to relinquish what you take. Perhaps there's someone who has suffered a very hard setback, maybe in business, in your finances, in a project that you were embarked on. What is your attitude? You know, God has given us a will, and he has given us emotions. And it is our emotions that give us the worst trouble, because we get all uptight and all upset about something that we had to suffer, the setback, whatever it is. And the Lord is reminding us that he is totally in control. He allowed that thing to happen, to suffer anything you inflict to be what you ask me to be at any cost, now and forever. His Eyes on the Sparrow, Part 11, A Word About Hymns. Later on, a, a program called All in Good Time. But right now we go to Ed McCulley and Jim Elliott, two of the missionaries who gave their lives in Operation Alka years ago. Well, they had a question and answer session, and we've been listening to a little bit of that. Well, today we'll hear a couple excerpts from that question and answer session as we think about prayer requests. Here's uh, Ed McCauley to get us started. Maybe there are certain things that you'd like to ask the folks back home to pray for. I know they're praying for us, and, and I think it helps if they have something definite and something specific to pray for. So you might mention just a few of those things before you leave us. All right. Whenever I tell anybody to pray for me, I tell them to pray for me in my language study. You see, down in the forest, we don't have any grammar textbooks. You don't uh, sit down and study a grammar to decide how these people talk. You have to study the language from the lips of the people themselves. And so Pete and I go around with a little notebook in our pockets all the time and write down words, write down phrases, write down expressions that these people use, and from that we sit down and figure out the words. Of course, many of them don't understand the difference between a word and a word. They'll run two words together and think it's one word, but if we who are going to write the language are going to analyze it at all, we have to decide what is a word. So we have to decipher the words, and then we make up vocabulary lists and are making a whole file of vocabulary cards just for every word in the language that we can find. And besides the words, of course, there are little uh, morphemes that float around here and there that we have to pick out and put in place and understand what they mean. Now, there's one thing about this kind of language study, and that is that it's very haphazard. You can waste an awful lot of time. 
For instance, one day I was talking to a man and asking him about uh, taking some things to Tena for us. We wanted him to carry something for us, and he asked us, Es yapa pesado? And I said, what is this word pesado? And he said, pesado, pesado, pesado. And so I tried to think for a while what it was. I hadn't recognized any word like that in Quechua, and I didn't recognize the Spanish word. Until one, then he told me the word that we did know in Quechua, Lyusha, which means heavy. And I understood from that that um, what he was trying to do was say the Spanish word pesado. He had said pesado, and it didn't sound to me at all like the Spanish word, and I didn't recognize it. So you can waste a lot of time trying to analyze the language. So pray that we won't waste our time down there getting this language. We want the language well. We want it soon. And it's a difficult problem to really get the language this way. There are all kinds of interruptions. You can't really sit down and study for a solid hour because somebody is bound to come in and want something, either a remedy or they're, want, they're wanting to sell a head of bananas or some such thing as that. And um, we can waste time and we want to save time in getting the language in a hurry. Part one, that was Ed McCauley talking to Jim Elliott. Jim was giving a prayer request and we'll have more of that discussion coming up a little later today. Right now, it's all in good time. You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliot, talking today about my friend, Donna Otto's book, All in Good Time. Donna Otto, who lives in Scottsdale, Arizona, was here to visit me this past week. And we were talking, as we do when we get together, about how to organize things. It's a constant concern of mine, and Donna has done an excellent book for those of you who need help in the area of your time management and organizing your closets and your garage and your kitchen drawers and your children and your whole life. The book is called All in Good Time, and it's published by Thomas Nelson. Donna told me this last week that a lady in Pennsylvania had called her in tears, absolutely sobbing. She was desperate. She did not have the slightest idea how to go about getting her house in order. Is there anybody listening today that's in that bad a situation? Let me describe what this lady told Donna. She said, I have three days' worth of dishes in the sink, I have laundry stacked up to my waist in the laundry room. There are dirty clothes in every room. Ironing is piled up all over the place. Newspapers, toys, waste baskets. And just, it was sort of a wail, Donna said, that came over the phone. What shall I do? And while she was talking, Donna was just sending up a little prayer to the Lord and saying, Lord, how can I give this woman some hope. I've got to give her some hope. What shall I tell her? Well, this is what she said. She said, you go out to your garage and you get a trash bag or a garbage can or a box or a basket for every room in the house. Take the garbage cans or the boxes or the baskets or the trash bags into the house, put one in every room, pick up every single thing in that room which doesn't belong there and put it in one bag. Dirty laundry, clean laundry, shoes, toys, newspapers, whatever it is, put it in the bag. Go to the next room and do the same thing. She said, I hoped that she would be able to see a difference quickly. And she said, I told her to call me back in about four hours. Do you know that that lady called her back in three hours? She said, I've done just what you told me. Donna said her voice sounded like a different person. She had given her hope. But then, of course, the next question, the lady said, what do I do now? Well, Donna wasn't at a loss for words. She said, now you take one room at a time, and you take the things out of the bag or the box, one at a time, and you put them in one of three piles. Make three piles, a put-away pile, a giveaway pile, and a throwaway pile. Now that's good advice. And I did have a lady talk to me who described her house in a very similar way. She only had two rooms. 
And when I suggested that what she needed to do was to start with the cleaning out of one drawer, she said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't think you heard me. I'm not talking about one drawer. I'm talking about not being able to walk across the living room. She said, we've only got two rooms. We've got a two-room apartment. You can't walk across the living room. I said, you mean there's stuff all over the floor? And she said, you got it. That's what I mean. And all over the furniture and all over the bed. Well, Donna Otto's book will help you. It's got photographs of Donna's closet. How many of you would like to have photographs of your closets published for the whole world to see? Well, I've been to Donna's house, and it's just exactly the way the pictures show in the book. She shows you how to put things in boxes and how to number the boxes and how to find them and how to stack them. It should be a lifesaver for a lot of you. Let me read to you Donna's two pages on the subject of establishing priorities. If there's one question that I get asked over and over and over again, it's, how do you set priorities, Elizabeth? You have so many things to do. You have books to write and a newsletter to do and radio programs and things like that. I don't understand how in the world you can set priorities when everything seems to be equally important. Well, this is what Donna says. And she's been talking about writing your goals down. Now that you've written your goals down and placed them in your day book and you're going to review them every so often, your life has become organized. Right? Wrong. You've still got to make your life phrase and goals a part of your everyday decision-making process. This is where priorities come in. Establishing priorities forces us to rate our choices. I shall do this rather than that. Unfortunately, too many of us just say yes to most activities. Priorities help us to say no. A number of years ago, I met an older woman at a church meeting. She wasn't beautiful, but she looked extremely attractive in a tailored gray suit. She talked to me about her family and asked me questions about my family, my interests, and my desires. In the next weeks and months, as I began to know her better, I was even more impressed. She cared for the needs of her family, and she still managed to serve on the school board and participate in a church women's group. One day, I asked this lady how she managed to look so well-dressed, accomplish so much, and still seem so relaxed and full of joy. I have learned to ask myself a very important question before adding any activity to my life. The question is, can someone else do it? At first, I didn't understand what she was saying, and I told her so. There are three, four, maybe five things in life that only I can do, she explained. Those things come first. Everything else is optional. I experimented with this concept in my life, says Donna, and I discovered that it really works. It helped me both to define my priorities and lock in on them so no one could sway me off target. Whenever anyone asks me to take on a new task, a new responsibility or obligation, I first ask myself, can somebody else do it? If the answer is yes, I ask myself, am I meeting my priorities? I like to speak on life management. Can anybody else do that? Yes. I like to teach Cub Scouts. Can anybody else do that? Yes, you bet they can. Can anyone else be David's wife? No. I'm the only one who can do that. I've not stopped speaking to women's groups, but I only accept engagements when they don't infringe upon the things that I alone can do. I stay loyal to my priorities. What are these priorities? What are those things that only Donna Otto can do? Not many in number, just as my friend said, but each a weighty and serious responsibility. Now, if you've got a pencil and paper handy, I would suggest that you may, may want to write down the five things that Donna Otto only can do because they will apply, as you will see, to your life. Number one, I alone am responsible for my relationship with God. And to save time, you can leave out the words I alone in the next four. I alone am responsible for my relationship with God. Number two, I alone am responsible for who I am. I have to provide myself with the intellectual and spiritual stimulation to become all I can be. Responsible for who I am. Three, I alone can be David Otto's wife. Other people will be his friends, his colleagues, his teachers. 
but I am the only one who can love and care for him as his wife. Number four, I alone can be Anissa Otto's mother. Other people will influence her life, but only I can give her a mother's love and care and thereby fulfill my responsibility to her. And the last one, I alone can manage my household. I might have a housekeeper or a husband who helps around the house. Nevertheless, I am ultimately responsible for managing my household. These five things can only be done by Donna Otto. They are my priorities. What are yours? Take a moment now to write them on a sheet of paper. You may be an only child, so the care of an aging parent may be one of your priorities. Now make them a part of your life. Keep them in the back of your mind as you go through the day. Write them somewhere in your day book. She is an organized woman, and as we were talking over our breakfast table just this last week, I was saying, now, when you go to visit Valerie, and she is going to be visiting my daughter, I think in September, she's going to be speaking for my son-in-law's church in California, I said, I hope you can help Val to help her children to make decisions about what to get rid of, because the job that is almost always asked of me when I go to visit my grandchildren is to help them organize their rooms and their closets and their drawers. And I'm delighted to do that, and I have lots of suggestions that I can make, but it always comes down to decisions. Now, do you wear this T-shirt? Do you need 19 T-shirts? Okay, can you sort out the six T-shirts that you do need and give away the others? And that becomes an agonizing decision for these children, not to mention the four-year-old who wants to keep all the papers that she brings home from Sunday school and all the pictures that she draws for mommy and all the letters that she writes to imaginary friends. And Donna's suggestion is that even the four-year-old must be presented with the ten papers that she's done in the last two days, and you have to say to her, you may keep two and she's going to have to learn early in life to make those agonizing decisions. Another thing that Donna said to me, which I thought was very interesting, she said, nobody's a pack rat. The people who collect things are the people who can't make decisions. Think about that one. Gateway to Joy 445, all in good time. Well, we go back to a brief question and answer segment from a longer discussion that Ed McCauley and Jim Elliott had decades ago. It's about prayer requests. You ever wonder what to pray for when it comes to a missionary out in the jungle or anywhere? Maybe there are cer- certain things that you'd like to ask the folks back home to pray for. I know they're praying for us, and, and I think it helps if they have something definite and something specific to pray for. So you might mention just a few of those things before you leave us. All right. Whenever I tell anybody to pray for me, I tell them to pray for me in my language study. And um, we can waste time, and we want to save time in getting the language in a hurry. That's one thing. Another thing is this planning of Shandia. We want to plan it right. We want to build it right. We want to build it so as we don't waste the Lord's funds that are being sent to us. So they should pray that we get bargains on things. (laughs) I don't suppose you thought about praying for missionaries that way, but we're looking for bargains in building materials to build old Ed a house here. And uh, such things as that. Another thing is getting along together. You never lived with another bachelor, I suppose. I've had a little experience, but out there in the jungle, it gets tiresome where nobody else in the, in the whole area uh, speaks your language to have to live with a fellow month in and month out. And um, I suppose, although I hate to admit it, that it gets a little tiresome for him to live with me. But so it goes, and that kind of thing needs prayer. We need to get on together. So pray that we'll be unified, that we'll have one heart and one mind to strive together for the faith of the gospel down there in Shandia. Ed McCauley asking Jim Elliott about prayer requests. In listening to one of our previous programs on the mystery of trials, Mariana said, loved being able to hear the voice of Jim Elliott. It's so fun when you guys include those old recordings. And on a program dealing with a personal encounter with contentment, Bosatina792 says, exactly what I needed to hear. Spotify responses to uh, our time together. Let us hear from you, too, if you get a chance. 
Well, thanks for joining us today, wherever we found you. On behalf of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, in cooperation with the Bible Broadcasting Network, let me invite you to check out elizabethelliot.org. More talks, devotionals, Gateway to Joy programs, and more. elizabethelliot.org. Until next time, may God remind you every day that you're loved with what? Yep. You are loved with an everlasting love, and underneath are the everlasting arms.